Tonight we're going to be studying the story of Esau selling his birthright to Jacob. So turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 25. And what I want to do is read the entire story starting in verse number 27. Now when I say the entire story, don't worry. It only goes to verse 34 and we're starting at verse 27. So it's relatively short. And I'm going to read it in the King James Version. And the reason I'm going to do that is because tonight as we go through it verse by verse, I'm going to be using different translations, the ones that I feel like are closer to the uh, original meaning of what the Hebrew says. And as a result of that, I can't just read the entire story going from different translations. So what I'm going to do is read it in the King James Version. So follow along with me as I read the story. And the boys grew up, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sowed his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, I know that you're familiar with this story, especially if you grew up in church. Because if you grew up in church, you probably went to Sunday school and you went to vacation Bible school. And this is one of the favorite stories in the Old Testament because we're trying to come in and contrast the character of Jacob and Esau. But what I hope to do tonight is show you some things that you probably have never seen before so that you see this through God's eyes, not our eyes. So let's study the story verse by verse, beginning in verse number 27. It says, And the boys grew up, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now the first thing I want you to notice is that Esau and Jacob weren't boys when this event occurred. People, they were men. They had grown up, and most likely they were in their early 20s. And that's a very important detail, because the author is letting us know what they grew up to be. Esau grew up to be a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob grew up to be a plain man who dwelt in tents. In other words, Esau grew up to be an irresponsible son, and Jacob grew up to be a responsible son. Now, how do I know that? I know that because of the way they're described. And if you'd been raised in a Jewish home and you could read the story in the original Hebrew, you would automatically come to the conclusion that Esau grew up to be irresponsible and Jacob grew up to be responsible. And let me show you why you would have come to that conclusion based upon the way they were described. First, let's look at the way that Esau was described. Esau grew up to be a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Now, as I said, if you were raised in a Jewish home and you were able to read the story in the original Hebrew, immediately you would know that Esau liked to play, not work. You see, in ancient Israel, hunting was a sport, not a profession. Let me say that again. Hunting was a sport, not a profession. The way you earned your living was by raising domesticated animals, animals such as sheep, goats, cattle, and by farming. Now, Isaac was more of a rancher than he was a farmer. Yes, he did grow crops. In fact, as we go along a little bit later, we're going to see a story where a famine comes, and Isaac went ahead and he sowed, he planted his seed, and he reaped a hundredfold. So we do know that he did farm. But I want you to understand that he was more of a rancher than he was a farmer. He had lots and lots of herds of different kinds of domesticated animals. And trust me, he was a very, very rich man. If you remember, Abraham was a very, very rich man. In fact, today we would say that Abraham was filthy rich. Look at Genesis chapter 13, verse number 2. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And if Abraham lived today, you would have all of these people wanting to come in and protest as he was on Wall Street. I'm just teasing. Now, he was a very, very rich man, and almost every bit of it went to Isaac. So Isaac was a very, very rich man. And he had more cattle and more sheep 
and more goats than he knew what to do with. So Esau did not have to hunt for a living. Not to put meat on the table. If you wanted meat, you could have had meat every night of the week. Why? Because that's all he had was sheep and goats and cattle. So why did he hunt? He did it because he liked to do it. And like most kids who's born into a rich family, he spent his time doing what he wanted to do, hunting rather than working, and daddy indulged him. Now, look back at the way that Esau is described. And the boys grew up, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Now, when you read that he was a man of the field, what does that make you think? It makes you think that he liked the outdoors, so he watched over daddy's flocks and herds, right? Wrong. You have to go deeper and do a word study. You see, the word field is translated from the Hebrew word sadeh. And in this context, it means wilderness or uninhabited land, the place where wild animals roamed. So what this is saying is that Esau liked to go on hunting trips. And that's what he spent all of his time doing. Instead of working, he spent all of his time hunting and fishing, doing what he loved to do. But my point is this. Every Jew who would read this story immediately knew that Esau was irresponsible. He liked to play rather than work. And daddy was an enabler. Daddy indulged him. He didn't make him work. And he allowed him to spend all of his time hunting just like most kids in wretched families do. Now, look at the way that Jacob is described. Look back at verse 27. And the boys grew up and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Now, I want you to underline the word plain. Now, before I tell you what this word means, let me ask you a question. When you hear the word plain, what do you think of? If I said that someone was a plain Jane, what, do you, what would you think that I meant by that? Unattractive. Ordinary. You would think that I meant that there was nothing special about her. She's not pretty, but she's not ugly. She's not outgoing, but neither is she a wallflower. She's just plain. She has no characteristics that makes her stand out. She's kind of homely. So when we read that Jacob was a plain man, we tend to think that he really wasn't special. There was really nothing special about him. But people, that's not what this word means. Not in the original Hebrew. You see, this word plain is translated from the Hebrew word tom. If we were to transliterate this word, we would spell it T-A-W-M, tom. It's used 14 times in the Old Testament. Nine times it's translated as perfect. Twice it's translated as undefiled. And twice as upright. In fact, let me show you how this word is used in the book of Job when it's talking about Job. Turn to Job chapter 1, verse number 8. Notice what God says to Satan when they're talking about Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, let me just give you a little insight into this. This, is not, this doesn't have anything to do with the story that we're studying, but I think it's important that you know. God was not pointing Job out to Satan. He knew that Satan had already been looking at him. So basically, how this says it in the original Hebrew is, you've been considering my servant Job, haven't you? Anyways, the Lord said unto Satan, you've been considering my servant Job, haven't you? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now I want you to underline that word perfect there. It's translated from the Hebrew word tom. It means righteous, upright. But more specifically, it refers to a man who does the right thing, both in the natural and in the spiritual. So why in the world did the English translators translate it as plain in Genesis chapter 25, verse number 27? Well, I'll tell you why. Because in 1611, when they translated the Bible into English, the word plain meant sincere or upright. But today it doesn't mean that. 
So as we're reading along in the King James Version, and we see that he was a plain man, we're going, hmm, a plain Jane. No distinguishing characteristic, nothing special about him. He wasn't good looking, but he wasn't ugly. He's probably kind of homely. He was a mama's boy, right? Uh Uh-uh, not at all. So here's my point. Every Jewish person who could read Hebrew and who read this story immediately knew that Jacob was an upright man, a man who did the right thing, a man who fulfilled his responsibilities. Now, we're going to look at some things that he does later on. But he does these things trying to do the right thing in the wrong way. Plus, mama's not helping him. But he's really got a good heart. And he's a man after God's heart. He's just going about it in the wrong way, like many of us do. In fact, I want you to look back at verse number 27, and I want you to see how else Jacob is described. It says, Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, what does he mean, dwelling in tents? In other words, he didn't go wandering off doing his own thing. No, he stayed at home tending to the family business, and he was the one the parents could depend on. And many times he was the one that would go out because they had to put their flocks in different fields, that he would go out and take a tent with them to stay to make sure everything was going right. So you've got one son that's irresponsible that wants to wander off and go do his own thing and to hunt, and you've got another son that's very responsible. He's someone that's described as Tom. He does the right things both naturally and spiritually and he stays at home and he's learning the family business to do what mom and dad wants. He's the one the parents can depend on. Now, look at verse number 28. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So as you can see, Isaac and Rebekah had favorites. Isaac's favorite was Esau, but not for the reason you think. We read that, and at face value, it makes it think like, woo, daddy liked to eat. Isaac must have been a big, fat man, and he just loved Esau because he went out, he killed all of this wild game, and he would just make a big feast out of it. No, you have to read between the lines and dig a little bit deeper. So his favorite was Esau, but not for the reasons you think. And Rebecca's favorite was Jacob. And this favoritism is what ends up causing great problems in the family. But that's another story. We'll get to those stories. Now, I want you to notice why Isaac loved Esau. At face value, it says, because he did eat of his venison. Now, I want you to underline the word venison. When we think of venison, what do we think of? Deer meat. He loved deer. But that's not what it means. It simply means wild game. You see, the word venison is translated from the Hebrew word satyed, which means wild game. So Isaac liked to eat the wild game that Esau killed. But there's more to it than that. And let me explain why I say that. We find out later in the story, when we get to more of the seedy part of the story, that Rebekah could prepare goat goat meat in such a way that Isaac couldn't tell the difference between it and the wild game that Esau killed. Turn to to Genesis chapter 27, and let's read verses 6 through 9. Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game, and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. You go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Now, if you're familiar with the story, Jacob goes, I don't know about that, Mama. What if we do that and he finds out I'm not Esau? Then I'm going to be cursed, not blessed. And Mama says, you don't worry about that. You let me handle the old man. You just go out and get me two young goats. And she prepares the goat meat. And when he takes it in there and Esau and Isaac eats it, he can't tell the difference between the two goats that she prepared and the wild game that Esau had been cooking. So why did Isaac favor Esau? Because there had to be more to it than the fact that he liked eating the wild game and that Esau killed, especially when you consider the fact that Rebekah could prepare goat meat to taste just like wild game. So what made Isaac favor Esau over Jacob? Well, this is where you have to dig. 
Because it goes back to the fact that Esau was a problem child. Let me say it again. Esau was a problem child. He wouldn't, he wouldn't work. All he wanted to do was hunt and fish. He was rebellious. As you study his life, you find out that he actually married Canaanite women simply because his parents didn't want him to do, want him to do that. In fact, he was so rebellious, whatever his parents said, he did the exact opposite. He was one of those kids that if you said, clean your room, he'd just sit on the bed. If you told him to stay in the house, he went outside. If you told him to stay outside and not come in, he came in. That's the way he was. Not only that, but he never considered the consequences of his actions. In fact, when you see the things that he does, it's kind of interesting. But he never considers the consequences of his actions, and he basically did whatever he wanted. He's the perfect example of a problem child. And that's why, listen to me, that's why his father was partial to him. Yeah. Believe it or not, it happens all the time. In fact, let me explain something to you about the dynamics of a family with a problem child in it. With almost every family that has a problem child in it, there's usually one parent that favors the problem child without even realizing it. And if you ask them if they did that, they would say, no, no. But they do. And the reason they do is because of the praxis principle. How many of you remember the praxis principle? How many of you don't remember the praxis principle? All right, let me give you the praxis principle and write this down. The way we treat people affects the way we feel about them. Let me say that again. The way we treat people affects the way we feel about them. That's why Jesus told us to love our enemies. That's why Jesus told us to pray for those who despitefully use us. That's why we're supposed to love everyone. And remember, that word love is agape. It is not a feeling, it's a behavior. Because God knows that if we behave in the right way towards someone, eventually it affects the way we feel about them. And I talked about that with marriage. If a husband does not treat his wife right, trust me, in several years he will fall out of love with her. Why? Because the way we treat people affects the way we feel about them. But if he treats his wife right the way that he should, it will affect the way he feels about it. It doesn't matter how old she gets, how wrinkled she looks, how gray her hair is, how much weight she puts on. If he treats her like a queen, he will feel like she's a queen. Why? Because of the praxis principle. And the praxis principle explains why in almost every family that has a problem child in it, there's usually one parent that favors the problem child without even realizing it. You see... When Isaac and Rebekah started having problems with Esau, Isaac did what most fathers do. He started making excuses for Esau's character. Or I should say, he was making excuses for his lack of character. Think about it. Isaac and Rebekah had two kids. One was always doing what he was supposed to do. That was Jacob. The Bible says that he was a plain man. The word plain is translated from the Hebrew word Tom, and it means that he does the right things, both naturally and spiritually. So he was a plain man. He was consistently doing the right thing. When Esau was out playing and doing whatever he wanted, uh-uh, Jacob was in the, the tents. He was learning the family business. He was doing what mom and dad wanted him to do. He was the responsible one. Now, the other child, Esau, didn't, and he was always getting into trouble. So Isaac started making excuses for the way he acted and for his character, which just enabled him to continue being irresponsible and rebellious. And to compensate for the guilt that he felt, the guilt that every parent of a problem child feels, he gave him preferential treatment without even realizing it. Now what do you mean, preferential treatment? In other words, he did not hold Esau to the same standard that he held Jacob. And that's what happens with the problem child in the family. We hold everyone else to this standard. Every one of the children that can go to the standard, we hold them to this. But when the problem child comes along, we don't hold them to the same standard. Why did he not hold him to the same standard as Jacob? Because number one, he thought he would never live up to that standard. So he gave up trying to make him do that. And number two, he was tired of the fights it caused. So he just allowed Esau to do just about anything he wanted to do, which is preferential treatment, especially in the eyes of the other children. Not only that, 
But like most parents of a problem child, Isaac looked for anything positive that he could praise Esau for, no matter how small it was. And the only thing that Esau really excelled at, read the story, people, there's only one thing. He was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. In other words, he liked to go on hunting trips. So guess what Isaac did? He did what most fathers do with a problem child, especially if it's a boy. He focused on that one good thing, and he started praising him for that. Wow, Esau, you're a great hunter. I love to eat your venison. Well, Mama was probably throwing the venison out because she could make the wild goat or the goats that they had taste just like the wild animals. She was fixing it just the way he liked it. But you see, he was so focused on Esau because he worried about him because his heart went out and he tried everything with him. Now, in cases like this, the focus is so directed towards the problem child to try and help the child. The other children are usually neglected. That's the way it happens in a home with problem children. And when you consider the praxis principle, you can see how this leads to favoritism, and that's what happened to Esau. Now, sometimes both parents become guilty of that, but usually it's not that way. Study families of problem children. I challenge you to do that. Go buy books of of uh, psychologists that have done studies on this. And you know what you'll find? Usually there's only one parent that does that, and the other parent kind of reacts the other way. And that's what happened to Esau. Now, Rebecca, as I said, went the other way. She disagreed with the way that Isaac dealt with the problem. So what she focused on was the good child. And when you consider the praxis principle, you can see how it led to favoritism. She loved Jacob because He was the responsible child, the dependable child, the good child, the child that did what he was supposed to do, the child that was learning the family business, the child that was respectful, the child that if you told him, don't do that, he didn't do it. Not Esau when she said, don't walk into the tent with muddy feet. He just walked on in. I've been hunting and I'm tired. And you just get tired of fighting with them. And she would go to Isaac and Isaac, and she would say, he won't do what I say. You need to discipline him. Said, I've tried everything. Let's praise him. So he went that way. She went the other way. And so what we find is when they describe this, and see, the problem with us is not being raised in a Jewish home and not understanding Hebrew. When we read verse number 27, we don't understand what it's saying. He was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Wow, that's good. No, 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 no. Every Jew in the time of Jesus and before Jesus would read that and go, oh my, what an irresponsible kid, a problem child. And then we read that Jacob was a plain man. He dwelt in tents. Oh, bless his heart. No, no, no. Every Jew who understood that from the time of Jesus and back and even forward, and even today, if you understand Hebrew, you read that and you go, ah, Jacob was a good child. He did what he was told. And so what we see is that the parents did exactly what happens to families with a problem child in it. One parent went one way and favored one child, and the other parent went the opposite way and favored the other child. So Isaac favored Esau because of the praxis principle. The way you treat people is the way you feel about him. He was always having to work with Esau and treat him. Finally, he gives into it. Boy, he does have special feelings. Rebecca comes the other way. She's spending time with him. He's doing what a a good boy he is. And so she loves Jacob. And you've got this favoritism going on. Verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. Now the word sod is translated from the Hebrew word zud, which means to boil. And the word pottage is translated from the Hebrew word nazid, which means super stew. So what Jacob was doing was boiling some type of soup. Now, later on it says stew, but they're really the same thing from the Hebrew word. So he was boiling soup. And about the time it was ready, Esau came home from one of his hunting trips. Notice it says that he came in from the field. Now, the word field refers to the uninhabited land. 
the place where wild animals roam. So Esau had been out on a hunting trip, and the implication is he hadn't killed anything on his two- or three-day walkabout. So he'd gone without food for a while. We don't know how long he'd gone without food, but when he came back, he was starving, and we said, I'm faint. What he means is, it was unsuccessful. I'm a cunning hunter, but I didn't kill anything. So I've been out on this trip, and I finally made it back, and I'm starving. I'm hungry. Verse 30. And let me read it from the NLT. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. Now this is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. In fact, remember that he's the father of the Edomites. Edomites actually, Edom, that's a, that's a ebony. In other words, it's named after Esau, whose other name was Edom. His nickname became Red because of the stupid thing he did. Yes, he probably had red hair, and we looked at that when he was born, but it tells us why he was named Red or Edom. It's because of this story, because of what he sowed his birthright for. for. His stupidity made him famous. Let's keep going. Now, Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of the red stew. Now, in verse number 34, we're told that Jacob was boiling a lentil stew. Lentils are kind of like a pea. And the type of lentils that Jacob used was what we would call Egyptian lentils. We don't see them around here, or maybe you guys do. Maybe you buy exotic food. But when we think of lentils, we think of ones that are kind of like peas, except they're green or brown. And these aren't. Egyptian lentils are like peas, except they're red. Here is a picture of Egyptian lentils. Yep, there it is. And when you boil them, it makes a red pea soup. Not peas, red lentil soup that looks kind of like peas. Now, Jacob was boiling this red lentil soup and Esau wanted some. Now, because there had always been a rivalry between the two from the time they had been in the womb, Jacob didn't want to give him any. This is just kind of the way it was. Jacob's attitude was what usually a good child is towards a problem child. Of course you're hungry. While I'm here doing what mom and dad wants, I'm learning the family business. Someone has to learn the business, and you're going to be the leader one day? You're out gallivanting around, just hunting and fishing and trying to do whatever you want to do. Of course you're hungry. And don't expect me to feed you. So Jacob didn't want to give him any. Now, in all probability, it had always been like this. They didn't share with each other because they had always been rivals. And they saw each other as rivals. And if one of them wanted something the other one had, they had to give them something in exchange for it. And they had probably grown up bartering each other or bartering with each other rather than sharing all through their childhood. So when Esau wanted some of Jacob's soup, Jacob saw it as an opportunity to get something from Esau. And he looked to see what he had, and of course it had been an unsuccessful trip. He wasn't going to use his bow. He wasn't going to use a spear or any of his arrows. So he looks to see what he has, and he has nothing. So he says, huh, you say you're about to die. You're that hungry. Sell me your birthright. Look at verse 31. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Like, yeah, what idiot would do that? Now, does everyone remember what, what the birthright was? The birthright went to the oldest son, and it entitled the oldest son to two things. Number one, he received a double portion of the inheritance. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. I'm going to read verse number 17. Very important passage of Scripture if you want to understand the birthright, you must know this passage of Scripture. In fact, if you remember one time Jesus was teaching, and someone came and said, tell my brother to share. And he said, who made me judge of you? Why did he say that? Because the law has already told us what to do. Now notice what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17. He must recognize the rights of his older son by giving him a double portion. He is the first son of his father's virility, and the rights of the firstborn belong to him. So, in this case, Isaac and Rebekah only had two sons. And the oldest son would get a double portion. In order to do that, you took the number of sons you had, 
and you added one more. So if you had two sons, you divided it into thirds. The youngest son got a third, but the oldest son not only got his third, but he got an extra portion. He got the other third, so he got two-thirds. If you had four sons, you would act like there's another one, and you say five. So you would divide it five ways. And each of the younger three sons would get 20%. But the oldest son would get his 20% plus an extra portion, which is 20%. He always got a double portion. Now, that was the first thing that he got, a double portion of the inheritance. The second thing that he received when the father passed away, he became the head of the family. He became the designated leader. He was responsible for providing for all of the unmarried women of the family, both materially and spiritually. He was supposed to be the spiritual leader of the family. That's why he got a double portion. It not only was a place of honor, but you were also expected to be the most responsible. You were supposed to be the spiritual leader. Now let me ask you a question. Just a little bit that we've seen here. Does Esau look like he should be the spiritual leader of the family? Be honest. No. And as we continue to read through the story of Jacob and Esau, you consistently see this is a problem child that grew up to be a problem adult. Well, he had many things. Remember when Jacob came back? Well, yeah, he also received even his part, his third. Not only did he receive all of these uh, herds of animals, but he also received servants who took care of it for him. But you'll find out that the Edomites never really amounted to much. And the reason they didn't amount to much is because they were just like their daddy. Okay, getting off. But that's what the birthright was. You got a double portion of the inheritance, and you became the designated leader of the family when the father passed away. You became the spiritual leader of the family. Now, there's a condition here. If the oldest son was irresponsible, the father had the right to give the birthright to a son who was more deserving. He did not have to give it to the older son. Why did he not have to give it? Well, the law says, yes, but there was an exclusion clause. The father had to deem the firstborn son to be responsible, to be able to fulfill his responsibility and to be the spiritual leader of the family. And if he couldn't do that, that was the exclusion. It would come in and trump Deuteronomy. Chapter 21, verse 17. Everyone with me? Now, let me give you scripture for that. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse number 1. The oldest son of Israel. Who was Israel? Who's Israel? Jacob. Remember, God changed his name from Jacob. No longer is he supplanter, but he is Israel. Israel means governed by God because he had a heart for God. So notice this is talking about the oldest son of Jacob. The oldest son of Jacob was Reuben. But since he dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubine, his birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical records as the firstborn son. Reuben forfeited his right to the birthright when he slept with one of Jacob's concubines. And because he was spiritually wicked and irresponsible, Joseph got the birthright. Now, if you read through here, what did it say? It was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. Why was it not given to Joseph? Because Joseph was filthy, filthy rich. He became second in command. Only one higher in Egypt to him was who? Pharaoh. Anything he wanted was his. And so when Jacob is there and he looks at his son Reuben, and we'll read that if we have time at the end, Jacob's getting ready to bless his kids. He's going to divvy out the inheritance, and he's giving a blessing to every one of them. He says, Reuben, my firstborn son, the strength of my power, you're as unstable as water. Yeah, that's what he says. And he says, I can't in good conscience give you the birthright. I'm going to give it to Joseph. And Joseph says, why would I need a double portion? And he says, bring your sons to me. And he brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they get each a portion. Remember, the firstborn, the birthright, gave you a double portion. So he got a double portion. 
he was able to give each of his sons their own portion, so each son got as much as the other sons. But here's the thing that I want you to understand. The father had the right and the responsibility because this was an important position. The oldest has to do what's right for the family. He's supposed to be the spiritual leader. He's got to take care of the women who are unmarried. He's the one that everyone's going to look to as the spiritual leader. So the father has to, in good conscience, give it to the firstborn if he knows he's responsible. But if he does, if he's not, he has the right to say, no, you're not responsible, son. I'm going to give it to, and he names the person. That's the importance of the blessing. We'll get to that. Now, Jacob knew that even though Esau was a problem child, he was irresponsible, he was rebellious, that Isaac was still going to give him the birthright. So he told Esau, if you want some of my soup, if you want some of my stew, then sell me your birthright. And Esau was stupid enough to do it, which proved that he wasn't worthy of it. Now, most of you don't quite get this, so let me actually give you an analogy to explain just how stupid this is. Let's suppose that you give one of your children a valuable heirloom, a ring that's worth $5,000. And they're having a little bit of financial problems. So they go down to the pawn store or the pawn shop and they pawn that ring, that $5,000 ring, and get $75 for it. Now they got three months or whatever the contract is to get it back. But when you find out, you know them. They're not going to get it back. They're going to lose a $5,000 ring and an heirloom for 75 bucks. People, this is Esau. I mean, he's going to sell his birthright, a double portion and a chance to be the leader of the family, the spiritual leader, the Messiah, is going to come through the spiritual leader of the family. It's going to be passed through him, but he sells it, which proved he wasn't worthy of. Look at verse 32. Look at his reasoning. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? Now, people, he wasn't about to die. He was just hungry. He just didn't care about the birthright. You see, he was so irresponsible, all he wanted to do was hunt and fish. In his mind, well, I don't care if I get a double portion. I'll just have servants take care of that. I'm just going to hunt and fish all day. I don't care about that. So he was willing to sell it for a bowl of soup. Now, people... How pathetic is that? Verse 33. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him selling his birthright to Jacob. Now, the reason Jacob made him swear that he was selling his birthright for a bowl of soup is because no one would ever believe it. And when you swore an oath, it's kind of like swearing an oath by God that, okay, I made you this promise, but I swear by God that I will keep it. And that's the reason he swore to it. But you want to know how irresponsible he was and what he's going to do the right thing? He went in to get his blessing. We're going to find that out in the later story. And people, the blessing and the birthright went hand in hand. Because the blessing is where the father says, who gets the birthright? And he's going to give him the birthright. And guess what? Esau's going to take it. Now, later on, when he finds out that he took the blessing, he goes, well, he stole the birthright too. No, he didn't. But now he comes clean. Wow. The guy's just worthless. But that's how foolish problem children are. This is just pr further proof that Esau didn't deserve the birthright. Now, if you remember, God knew that Esau would be this way when he was still in the womb. That's why he told Rebekah, the older will serve the younger. He reversed the Hebraism. The Hebraism was the younger will serve the older, but he came and said the older will serve the younger, and they knew exactly what that meant. It meant that the, the oldest should not get the birthright. You make sure that the youngest gets the birthright and the older will serve him. Verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now I want you to underline the word despised. The word despised is translated from the Hebrew word baza, and it means to regard with contempt or disdain. It's nothing of value. Who cares? He couldn't have cared less about the birthright. He knew he was still going to be rich, and he didn't want the responsibility that went along with it. So at that time, it's, I don't want that spiritual responsibility that goes along with it, and that's why he was undeserving of it. Now, here's what's interesting. Most Christians consider Jacob to be the culprit in the story. Let's be honest. How many of you 
you're so familiar with this story, but every time you've read this story or you've heard it taught, Jacob was always the culprit of the story. He tricked Esau into giving it to him. He's the bad guy. He took advantage of the situation and took advantage of Esau. Here's what's interesting. This is the truth. There's not one place in the scriptures that ever condemns or criticizes Jacob in any way for doing that. Did you know that? That's right. In fact, the scriptures always place all of the blame on Esau. Why? Because he didn't deserve the birthright. And that was just proof of it. And God knew that. In fact, he knew that Esau wouldn't be deserving it before he's ever born. And that's why he told Rebekah. The younger or the older will serve the younger. And she knew exactly what it meant. And she told Isaac about it. But Isaac didn't want to hurt Esau. Oh, I think he'll step up. I think he'll be the person. Now, let me tell you something. Jacob learned a valuable lesson for this. So when he gets ready to bless his children, inheritance time, he's going to speak these things before God. Now, you need to understand what he always says before the Lord. And the reason it would say the blessing before the Lord is because the Lord's the judge. You know how people fight over the will? Well, back then in the Old Testament, they would do this before God because if you start fighting over the will, this was all designated before God. Now, Jacob gets ready to do it. Turn with me if you would. Got to read this. It's not going to come up here. Grab your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 49. We're almost to the very end of Genesis. 49. I have to get back from my Bible. And I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. Well, let's just read verses 1 through 4. Is that all right? And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. This blessing is not only going to, be tell, it's not only going to give them their inheritance, but it's also going to foretell their future. So prophecy is built within this. Why was prophecy within this? Because Jacob was a prophet. People, he was a plain man, Tom, righteous, doing the right thing. He was a man that was doing the right thing, not only physically, but spiritually. Did he make mistakes? You betcha he did. But he was a man after God's own heart too. Now notice this. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Israel and hearken unto Israel your father, me Jacob. Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might. In the beginning of my strength and the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Boy, he starts off good. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Sorry, you're my firstborn. And I was proud of you. You looked good. But you're an unstable as water. You will not excel. Because thou wentest up to the Father's bed, and then defileth it, thou shalt went up to my couch. And then he goes on. He said, that's it. You don't get it. Sorry. It's character, son. You don't get the birthright. And you go on down. Judah gets the blessing. <gasps> the spiritual blessing. The Messiah is going to come through the tribe of Judah. Mm-hmm. Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim the sons of, of uh, Joseph, they get the birthright. Jacob learned an important lesson. You do what God tells you to do. 